late, so I only actually joined. Okay, thanks, Francis. Um, I just wanted to introduce myself because I joined the group quite late. So I only I did participate in the in the boot camp, and uh, and finished my project, and uh, I loved it basically. And uh, I just started it for a bit of fun, so I didn't really know what was going to come out of it. But as soon as I started, I realised that I needed to. Um, <laughs> pursue a career in Web3 and crypto, uh, it was just too exciting to, to ignore it. Um, mm. And so anyway, I, I discovered the group in January, so I'm not sure how well um, you all know each other. Um, but yeah, I've only been to a few of the meetups um, that Francis has organized. Um, so thanks a lot to Francis for organizing all these meetings and, and for, to all the presenters. Yeah. I always find it really interesting and a good opportunity to learn a bit more. Um, and uh, today I'm going to talk a bit about um, NFT fractionalization. So basically, if you have an ERC721, um, how can you split it up into smaller parts to share? Mm. And this was actually the topic of my, um, of my bootcamp final project. Um, so I wrote a small uh, fractionalization protocol, a very simple one. And uh, I didn't really look left or right very much at the time. Uh, I was quite overwhelmed with uh, just getting everything in place. Um, so I just checked the, the leader in the field at the time, Fractional Art, and had a look at their website and saw what they did, but I didn't really look at their contracts. So uh, this has been a nice opportunity to revisit um, this topic and, and have a bit of a deeper look at what, um, what real fractionalization protocols are, so not, not my... Uh, um, template implementation. So um, let's get started, I guess. Um, so fractionalization is basically um, it's a protocol or a smart contract um, which implements an NFT vault, meaning that you can send your NFT, your ERC721, to that vault and you'll get locked in that vault. And in return, you get to um, fungible tokens, which you can then distribute to other people um, or to other addresses um, in the form of either um, ERC-20, more typically, or also ERC-1155 tokens. And the aim of this um, is twofold. Um, it allows um, shared ownership of an otherwise uh, single token or a collection of NFTs. Um, as you've seen, uh, some of the NFT prices went extremely high and perhaps people still want to be able to feel part of it. So shared ownership allows that. And it also enables um, better liquidity for people who want to participate in these markets. That can be another aim. And just at the moment, I mean, the, all the hype is about um, profile pictures and JPEGs and all these things, but I just think it's, it's useful to keep in the back of our minds that um, JPEGs are really just one application of, of NFTs, and it's just the beginning. I mean, it's going to get much more interesting. I mean, everything that comes up is basically going to be, you know, everything you can talk about in the real world can be re represented by an NFT, and that's going to be very exciting, I think, in the future. Um, so just looking at the liquidity perspective, <laughs> I had no idea about these before I started this present, uh, looked into this presentation, but there's two platforms, NFTX and NFT20 that take the fractionalization uh, topic from a, from a liquidity perspective. So they actually um, allow users to deposit NFTs to their platforms, and then you get an ERC-20 back based on the NFT collection that you deposited. And I mean, NFT markets can be quite a liquid. Um, so this basically allows you to participate in the liquidity pool um, to essentially just help liquidity to allow people to participate in these markets more efficiently. The perspective we'll be focusing on today, and that was also the, the focus on my um, project, was more emphasis on the shared ownership perspective. So the leader in the in the field, um, fractional art, is a protocol which does implement well implements a fractionalization protocol. Um, and the other two at the bottom, there, I'm not sure if there is a pro another protocol running at the moment apart from fractional fractional art. I don't think so. Um, Whale and B20 are basically two collections. So Whale is, Whale is actually a token that's existed for quite a while. 
Um, it's called a social token, and there's basically a, a guy behind it, um, Whale Shark, who's very passionate about NFTs, and he's collected a huge amount of NFTs. And I'm not sure how it works, but he's he's somehow got them in a vault, or I don't know, stored them somewhere in an address. And apparently, the the token um, that you can buy um, also on exchanges allows you to then own a fraction of this um, of this collection. And B20 is um, has a collection of people of 20 people works that um, Metaverse created, so that you could also take part in that uh, collection of NFTs. Um, the difference between the protocol, I mean, obviously the protocol would enable the last two. So fractional.art would actually allow Whale and B20, to, they would actually allow the uh, user to implement or them to implement those, that shared ownership within their protocol. And um, as, you, as you know, everything in crypto is early days. Um, so everything's changing all the time. And there are other platforms um, upcoming. Spectra looks very interesting, very exciting. <laughs> In a way, I'd almost wish that I'd uh, decided to present the Spectra protocol. It looks really awesome um, from what I can tell. Um, I mean, another platform, IXWAP announced a, an NFT fractionalization platform. Um, but for the rest of this topic, we're gonna concentrate on fractional art and have a bit of a deeper dive into how that works. Um, so if there are any questions or if I'm at all unclear or you just have something to contribute, please just chime in. So if there's no questions, I'll, uh, I'll just carry on, but please pipe up if you've got, if you've got something to add. So um, I consider fractional art quite well known. Um, it, it was kind of made popular by the fractionalization of the original Dodge NFTs, um, two, two entities did that, Cryptopathic, um, Front Run, Please a Doubt. Um, they both took, these are images, um, we can have a quick look at the vault on fractional art. Um, so these are literally pictures of the original Dodge meme that um, is all over the internet. Um, and I think there was in total five photos taken um, this one is owned by Please Adal, as you uh, can see here, they're the curator of this vault. So we're on the Fractional Art website, and we're now looking at so-called vaults. So um, this vault um, contains a single NFT. Vaults can also contain a collection. And um, here you can see what you have in the vault, a, a brief description, and then you have some kind of key statistics on this vault. Um, as I said, um, when you fractionalize, you get um, in general, uh, typically you get an ELC20 in return. And people have participated in, in this and have bought these tokens on, on decentralized exchanges. And apparently um, the price that people are willing to pay for these tokens put, puts it an evaluation of $80 million um, for this NFT. Um, make of that what you will. Uh, it, um, the, um, what's interesting is you know, these markets are quite liquid and it's, it's quite tricky. Um, only 8.3% of the entire ERC-20 supply is actually collectible. So that means there's a big holder. And if you, if you scroll down, um, you can see that Please Adele actually does still own 73.2%. Um, so if you wanted to um, participate in fractional ownership here, you should probably be quite sure that Please Adele have best intentions for, for the holders of this uh, of this token. Um, and what else can you see here? You can see um, that here you have a, an interface to Matcha, which is a DEX aggregator. So someone, presumably please it out, set up a liquidity pool on an automated market maker. And here you can um, trade directly in the fractional art interface to, to obtain, your, you can send your hard earned ether and get some gold in return. Um, there's also, it's also possible to buy this NFT outright, um, but that goes, that works via an auction process. You have to send the reserve price, um, which is, uh, seemingly quite high. I guess they don't really want anyone to buy it yet. Um, so you'd have to send that amount of ether to, um, the vault and then an auction process starts. 
and then you you have to bid higher if you if you get outbid. Um, we'll look into a little bit where this reserve price comes from in due course. So that's um, basically a vault. Um, I would just add that fractional to art certainly it, its focus is to is to provide shared ownership of high value NFTs, which is exactly what you see here. So if you have a look at the other collections or vaults, sorry, in they're, they're generally quite highbrow um, NFT collections. Um, Haramba is another meme that was recently um, at least announced by Cryptopathic. And then you have, um, you've got your punks, you've got your daisies. Um, um, Russell Briggs collection was fractionalized to raise money for him from the free Rostal. Um, Dutch Cryptopathics uh, Dodge NFT from the same, originally from the same collection as Lisa Dow's. Um, anyway, uh, you see, uh, you see what you've got. You've got different vaults. Um, and going back. <clears throat> We can have a, there's one thing maybe we can have a quick look at. Well, maybe we should have a, now that let's, let's have a quick look at Etherscan. So if you go to um, one of the vaults, then, I mean, the website's really nicely presented. You have to say that, like, it's, it's very well laid out. You can see that this one's been verified. You can see the original NFT on OpenSea. Um, you can see the history um, of what happened to this NFT. Um, then um, you can also see the vaults contract on Etherscan. So starting to move slowly towards the um, towards the implementation. Um, every vault is a smart contract. So it's not one smart contract that manages all vaults. Um, every vault is a smart contract, and. You can see here that the, um, the source code has been published um, and it's open source. You can also go to the um, to Fractional Arts um, GitHub site and you can look at the contract. Um, I'll just mention it in passing while we're here. Um, I certainly hadn't seen this um, before. I looked at these contracts. Um, if you look at the read and write contract they used to um, or I'm used to from other um, smart contracts that you look in Etherscan, you have the read and write, but there's not really much there. Um, but Etherscan picks up apparently that this is a proxy and it says that the implementation for this contract is actually at this address, not the one representing this vault. And it still manages to render all the functions as you'd expect um, and allows you to interact with the contract. Um, so it recognizes the implementation is here and managed to provide the ABI for that in the ETH space, which is quite nice. So just a bit of an overview, um, there's a very nice, uh, June analytics uh, dashboard for fractional art um, to give you a bit of an idea of uh, some statistics. So apparently 2,300 um, NFTs have been locked up. And apparently, I mean, I was quite surprised by this number that the total value locked up in, in fractional vaults is, is nearly 2 billion. So that's quite a lot. Of course, um, we did just look at the um, implied evaluation of, of the Dodge NFT, which seemed rather high. So um, you can imagine that this is perhaps, um, well, it is what it is. Um, it's crypto, it's a bit inflated maybe, but that's how it is. Now, if you create a vault, uh, you become the vault create, uh, curator. And so that means 1,100 um, accounts have um, created, or they are curated. Um, and of these 2,300, only 1,200 are single NFT vaults. Otherwise, you have a collection. I won't go into um, collections too much today. It's basically um, 
but we've uh, bolted on before uh, the logic that we'll look at later. Um, if you have a collection, you get an NFT representing that collection, and then that's fractionalized. I'm um, just having a quick look at which kind of projects are in. We, we did already have a quick look at the CryptoPunks and the bases. Um, this is ordered by number fractionalized. So the top here is actually Ethereum name service. So the, the ENS um, domains that you're most likely familiar with, um, when you purchase a domain name from ENS, it's also an NFT. And there's also very many um, ENS domain names that have been fractionalized in fractional. Um, So it's not just about JPEGs even now. Um, and so just quickly, um, just I noticed something quite interesting while I was looking through um, the, um, the fractional website, and that's that they now also offer um, fractionalization to uh, 11.55s, the SP 11.55s. And these, um, the, I mean, there's, um, the benefit of this is for NFT people, you can trade these um, fractions on OpenSea and you can see it. Um, I'm not sure whether you have all the benefits of the LC20 when it comes into um, mod modular and plug into DeFi protocols. I'm not sure you have those available, but um, it certainly seems to be um, desired by certain users. Um, and you can see here, if you go and explore the collections, then um, you can filter by vault type. And if you just have a look at the 1155s and then um, have a look at the vault, you still have a link to the vault on Etherscan. But interestingly enough, um, the contract has not been published. Um, and that there's no mention of 1155 in the, in the, in the GitHub uh, contracts. So they don't want to show you this yet. So they've upgraded the contracts, but it's not open sourced yet. Um, and if you do um, connect your wallet and try and fractionalize, it does warn you that 1155 is, um, is, is basically uh, an early preview and that you should proceed with caution and that an audit is pending for this new feature which I found quite interesting that for me, that seemed a little bit rushed, but I guess that is the nature of things that you want to stay on top of it and you want to um, maintain your, your user base. Um, so today um, we're only gonna look at ERC-20 fractionalization for obvious reasons. Um, any questions or anything to add up to this point? So, um, just wanted to show you here that there's basically four main contracts we're going to look at today. Um, so when you go to the user interface to, to fractionalize, you interact with um, the Vault Factory contract. Um, and this then mints um, a new fractionalized NFT um, contract, which um, points to basically it, it instantiates on the um, a new initialized proxy, um, which sounds a bit uh, cryptic, and we'll have a look at that in a moment. Um, but so this is actually the code that gets deployed when you create a new vault, um, but it makes use of a settings code, which is basically um, representing the governance of fractional. And it makes use of the logic from this contract, which is just deployed once, but it uses that, that logic. And that's what we saw in Etherscan when we were talking about um, the, uh, the proxy. So it's just a proxy for the logic um, in this contract. So those are the four contracts we're gonna look at today. So we can um, deep into the, dive into the vault factory and we're gonna have a look at the mint function. Um, this is the interface on fractional. So you need to provide your vault name. You then specify the parameters of your ERC-20 the token total supply of the token, um, the sim its symbol. Then you set the reserve price for which it can be bought for that we saw earlier. 
And then one thing that we didn't mention, which is an in another interesting um, feature of fractional art, is that you can set um, an annual management fee. So you can um, set a value between zero and 10%, which goes to the vault creator, to the curator. So um, let's have a quick look at the code. Um, so we can see that the vault factory is ownable and plausible from Open Zeppelin, inherits from the Open Zeppelin contracts. Um, this is really the, the contract which stores all the information about the vaults that Fractional has. Um, so it has a vault count and then it has a mapping um, from you and an unsigned integer to, um, to addresses, which are the vaults. Um, each vault is an address, a contract and address. And then here you see already that we have the addresses of the um, settings contract and of the logic contract. So the logic contract is called token vault. That's um, this guy here, e ERC 71 token vault. Um, this is very uh, slim contract. All it does is um, basically sets the settings and the logic, so the governance settings and the, um, the actual vault logic and enables a user to mint a new um, fractionalized NFT, um, passing the parameters that we saw in the UI um, at the beginning. This is the NF address of the NFT um, contract that you want to fractionalize. That's the tokens ID. Um, then you've got the supply of your ERC-20, the name and symbol of your ERC-20, the price you want to list it for, and the curator fee. And um, now it gets already quite interesting. Um, so here you're, you're signing, um, you're encoding um, the call data into a bytes array with the um, initialized function signature and the values that the user passed to um, the mint function. And we save this in initialization call data. And then we create a new vault from the initialized proxy contract. Now we pass to the initialized proxy the logic, which is the address of this um, ERC-71 token vault and the call data. So actually we don't really do very much here. We just pass on the call to another contract. Um, although importantly, we do transfer the NFT. So you have to have approved your NFT for transfer before you call this function. Um, then we add the vault that's created. Presumably, if this is successful and the transaction doesn't revert, then we add um, the vault to the to the to the vaults mapping, increase our number of vaults. So far, so good. Um, so far, we've touched on, on the three other contracts. So we've seen settings. Let's have a quick look at the settings. That's um, a simple place to start. So um, settings, basically, um, well, the purpose of the contract is to allow, um, presumably, to allow um, the fractional team now, whether this is controlled by a DAO or not, is, it doesn't seem to be documented. Um, but it allows um, the fractional team to basically um, impose some control over vault settings. Um, and indeed, it actually allows them to um, kick out a curator if they deem a curator to be misbehaving, um, which could be controversial if uh, this DAO is not well managed. Um, but in, in typically it seems to be to manage the um, vault settings such as maximum auction length, maximum curation fees and, and all these kind of things. Um, since they have quite a lot of control, so basically they could kick out a curator. So you could have fractionalized your very expensive NFT and then they decide that they don't like you and they kick you out and presumably can take the NFT for themselves. 
I wanted to dig into whether this contract is actually, um, I mean, who, who controls this contract? So you can, you can check on, on Etherscan that, that um, it, oh, sorry, this is, this is not right. It was actually initially owned by user accounts. Um, sorry, is right. It was um, initially owned by user accounts, but subsequently you can see that um, in a transaction that the, um, that the ownership of this contract was transferred to this address. And um, just jumping to the code very briefly, settings inherits from ownable um, from Open Zeppelin. And that enables you um, to transfer ownership. So you gain access to this function. And this is what's being called here with this address, the new owner. And um, if you look at the um, at this address, you can verify that this is actually a multi-sig contract um, and it's a Gnosis safe who um, implement um, or try to implement easy to use multi-signature um, contracts for, for users. So I found also that quite interesting to dig into, so it's worth mentioning. Um, and otherwise the settings contract is nothing um, particularly interesting. Um, it basically uh, declares a lot of variables, um, sets absolute maximum values, um, and then it gets, um, it's constructed, it gets created with default values. And um, then assuming uh, that you have the governor, you are the governor, and you can, um, this multi-sig address can call this contract, then you can set um, parameters for the vaults. For example, the max curatively. Um, I found this quite interesting, actually. I just stumbled upon it again now. Um, so this method of this function set max creator fee, um, it emits um, an event um, update creator fee, but for some reason it, it gives the governance fee and not the creator fee. So maybe it's the same. Um, but it seemed, yeah, not necessarily the same. It seemed a bit sloppy to me. I don't know, given that it's been audited, but um, it's only an event. So. I, I find it interesting that it it emits event before it updates the fee. That's also quite interesting. I mean, essentially, it's just setting it, so maybe that's harmless. But yeah, yeah. But agreed. Yeah, um, <laughs> it would be what you're used to reading. Yeah, but the same the same is in in minting. I I could see in the first contract. Okay, let, should we have a jump back? So was that Philip? Please. So yes, you're right. Yeah. I mean, this, this is quite interesting. Um, you're absolutely right. So here the, the event is emitted before the NFT is transferred. So um, I, I think yeah. I think that I can kind of understand because typically the principle is that you update internal state before you do external call, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, but the yeah the, the other the other one is um you it it meets before it updates, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so um uh, yeah it's a bit weird. <laughs> yeah, agreed. I mean, um, in this, I case, think it doesn't matter too much because like. If it doesn't mint, the whole thing's going to revert and you won't get the event emitted. And like the mint doesn't actually change anything in the like in the blockchain state, it just goes into the log. Yeah, I I, I mean it doesn't really affect the outcome because if if it's not successfully updated the fee, then the event will not mint because everything will revert to original state. Yeah, yeah, that's true. 
I mean, in, in your experience, these events, is it more just to provide a log um, to developers of what's happened or are they really used by user interfaces to update their state? Because the latter to me seems a little bit dangerous. <laughs> in general. Yeah, but even, even at that, right? Like even the aspect of updating the states, for example. So if you emit the event, now the only reason, the only if it's used to update states on the front end, the front end only gets the states when the entire block has been processed. Mm -hmm. So if the entire mm -hmm. block has been processed, that means nothing really can go wrong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is true. But to, to answer your question, um I I the event is usually used to write the subgraph. Uh, um so subgraph is like the on-chain database, like the um, basically uh, once the transaction is done, then the event will be emitted and then the and then it will someone can write a subgraph to kind of capture the data from the event. Okay. <clears throat> okay, interesting. Yeah. So um, a naive question. When you're talking about subgraph, you're talking about like the graph protocol. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Isn't isn't it more of like the graph making utility of the event? Like um the event came before the graph, and then the graph since they are trying to build an on-chain index and whatnot, one of the best ways to get information of new new state change is essentially using events per se. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I think we can leave settings there, um, unless you have any um, and move on. Um, so we already saw the initialized proxy. So basically the main purpose of this before we dive into the code is that um, when a user or the website creates a new vault, only if initialized proxy contract is deployed. So um, to me, its main purpose seems to be uh, gas optimization. Um, and then this contract uses the vault logic from the LC721 token vault. And um, as we saw earlier on Etherscan, it picks up nicely that this um, newly deployed contract um, is a proxy and provides still provides a nice interface. So um, just going back to the code. Um, so we saw that we here we initialize um, we instantiate um, an initialized proxy with the logic, which is an address, and um, the call data which we've encoded here. And then we go to the um, initialized proxy contract, um, which is also very small, but there's a lot to dive into. So um, basically, when this contract is, um, is instantiated, um, the constructor gets called and it delegates the call um, with the data that we, we um, basically the function call from, from the vault factory gets then passed um, and delegated to the token vault logic. So this, this function call and data gets interpreted in the context of this contract. And before we jump to that contract, we'll just, um, finish up with the initialized proxy. So the only, the only function um, or the well, only, in, this, fun, this contract only implements the um, fallback and the receive um, functions. And the, the fallback function is, is the interesting one. So basically here we, it, it starts writing assembly. Um, and what it does is it basically gets um, the payload of the function, so it actually gets, so when a user, so for example, thinking about from a user perspective, a user may want to now um, 
on this vault, you may want to bid on an auction. So he calls the bid function and provides his new price. But this function does not exist in the initialized proxy. So what, so of course the fallback function gets, um, gets called and then the function um, data or the, 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 function, the function signature and, and data that was called gets copied. Um, and then this is passed by the delegate call opcode to the implementation, which um, is just the logic. So basically we are now passing the function call to the ERC-72 token vault. And then we just need to make sure that it, whether it worked or not. So we have a look at the result and revert if it didn't work or return um, the data if it did work. Now, um, this is quite cryptic and um, for me, I, it didn't seem to make a lot of sense. <laughs> um, so if you, if you have a, a look at the documentation, you can, you can find this in, um, in the Open Zeppelin documentation when they're talking about um, upgradable contracts. Now, um, this, this snippet basically explains um, what it doesn't really tell you why, but it does explain what is happening. So it says that we're using the delegate call opcode which executes the callee's code in the context of the caller's state. So the caller is the initialized proxy, but it's calling the logic from the token vault within the initialized proxy state. That is the logic contract controls the proxy state and the logic contract state is meaningless. So the, 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 contra the logic in the token, in the central token vault logic, which all vaults use, the state there is not uh, relevant. It's only the proxy state which is now used. So the proxy doesn't only forward transactions to and from the logic contract, but also represents both of these contract state. Um, the state is in the proxy and the logic is in the particular implementation that the proxy points to. So that's basically what this what this block is doing here of assembly is doing. I think it's interesting because like I think that's like the shortest way I've seen to implement a proxy contract pattern. Mm -hmm. Cause like there's this sort of pattern of proxy contracts mm -hmm. and that sort of contain the state but then call the logic of an unimplement contract uh, in a lot of instances, but it's always like a pretty, like probably a few hundred lines to do the proxy contract logic. Whereas here it's like pretty much done in less than 50 lines. <laughs> so I thought that was, so I don't, I don't know how they compare, but I thought that was pretty interesting. I also found it quite interesting. Um... There's also one point I don't entirely understand, <laughs> um, or many, many, maybe point, many points, but um, one aspect, when I first saw this, I thought they were trying to implement an upgradable con contract. And I'm still not actually sure if they did. <laughs> maybe someone can help me. Um, so I, well, let's, let's have a look at the token vaults. I guess the contract they would want to update is this guy, the logic, not the, the vault because obviously the logic is here. Um, so when you look at this contract, um, it looks like it's meant to be an upgradable contract. But as far as I can tell, um, looking at this contract alone, I'm not sure if it does actually implement an upgradable contract. So comparing with the Open Zeppelin documentation, um, for what you have to do to make a contract upgradable. Um, when you, instead of using the RC20 and the RCC721 versions of the um, Open Zeppelin contracts, you have to use the upgradable versions, which is what they're certainly doing. Um, 
and then skimming over these um, all the all the state variables, which are then maintained in the context of the proxy contracts. Um, the constructor is very slim, and this seems to adhere to the Open Zeppelin documentation for upgradable contracts that your initialization code doesn't go into the constructor as you might expect. It has to go into a separate separate initialize function. Um, so when you go to the to the GitHub contracts for fractional art, you can't see the tool chain. So you can't see their hard hat or you can't see their, um, their truffle um, configuration. You can't see if they're using the Open Zeppelin plug plugin to, to make the upgradable contract. But the reason why I think it's not upgradable and anyone is very welcome to correct me if I'm wrong um, or if they, if they can help me is that um, the logic, I mean, the vault factory points to the logic. Oh. Which inherits from the token vault from this guy. Because I think another way to use proxy other than upgrading is for a factory sort of pattern where you want to have one base contract and you want to create a lot of instances of that with that, but you want to change the variable slightly each it's time. Exactly, it's exactly what they want to do. Yeah. So I, th I think that's what they want to do. I'm not really sure why they um, then use the initialize it um, function here. In that case, they could have put it in the constructor as far as I understand. I mean, for me, it seems like a gas optimization. You Just what you said, you want to have a factory, you want to um, redeploy essentially, but with different state. And that's what they're doing. Um, but of course you have a, as you said, a initialized proxy with less than 50 lines, which um, obviously reduces the amount of gas you have to spend in order to deploy. Anyway, that's um, that's how I understood it, but I'm happy to sort of correct it if anyone knows a bit more about upgradable contracts. Um, without further ado, um, then we can have a look at the uh, token vault contract. So we already um, discussed briefly the, well, not so briefly, the upgradable logic. We certainly discussed the proxy logic. Um, and um, other interesting things that what we discussed when we looked at the website was the curated fees, um, in particular the claim fees function, and um, the fact that you can buy out the NFT for an auction. So we can have a little look at the, at the, the code in here. I think the interesting parts are over, to be honest. Um, the fees are quite interesting. So just going back to the top, um, so what we have to think of when we, this is basically the logic that every vault has, but with the state from the proxy. So all these um, variables are maintained in the proxy. Um, we have access to the, to the governance contract that we mentioned. And um, the, the contract has a curator, which is um, at the beginning, the person that created the vault. We set the fee. Um, when we look at the fee, what's important is that it's per mil. So they write 100 to mean 10%. Um, <clears throat> so um, there's a function to claim fees. So you need to know when fees were last claimed. Um, you need to know if the vault is still open, obviously. You don't want to have people claiming fees if it's closed. Um, now, another interesting aspect for the auction is that everyone who, this is actually quite an important point that I didn't mention earlier, everyone who owns the underlying ERC-20 from a fractionalized NFT 
if the NFT gets bought out from the contract through an auction process, then the proceeds from this auction gets distributed amongst the ERC20 holders. So that's quite a nice um, feature. And that means that you can also participate in specifying the reserve price if you own um, underlying ERC20 tokens. Um, so these are voting tokens. This number here is basically the number of ERC20 tokens that have voted on the reserve price. And user price is, is basically a, a mapping of all the addresses that have voted on the reserve price at some point. So um, the initialize um, function sets the um, mainly sets the state, and then they mint the um, the specified supply of ERC twenty tokens and sends them to the curator. So this. Um, function, I think, is from the um, Testament ERC20 implementation. That's minting a new, you create a new ERC20. I had a question. Mm -hmm. Please. Oh, um, so, um, uh, be, um, yeah, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, just don't get it. Uh -huh, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, you don't, you don't understand the principle of fractionalization or? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so how does that work? Okay, so you have an NFT, right? It's, it's um, an NFT is a single token. You can't share it. One address owns the whole token. Yeah. And now you want to have two people, or let's say a hundred people want to share this token. So. That's not possible, right? Exactly. At the moment, it's not possible. It's not possible, possible using ERC721. So what this protocol does is um, you send your NFT to this contract. Yeah. And in return, you get 100 ERC20 tokens of a new ERC20 that you specify. So you say, um, you send your amazing NFT. And then you give, um, you say, my amazing uh, NFT, my ERC20 should have amazing NFT token. Yeah. Symbol should be amazing. <coughs> and then when you send your NFT to this contract using this function, or at least that from the vault factory, then the NFT- there, there's, there's like a lot of uh, numbers. I see. Um, just a second. So you send the NFT here and then you get the ERC20 in return. Yeah, yeah. I see UNT256 underscore V. That's where you're writing, right? Right now. You're typing like underscore symbol. You're yeah, on that exactly. thingy. Yeah. yeah. So this, so you say I want um, an amaze NFT, uh, ERC20, sorry, with 100 tokens. So what if I want to become like a, a millionaire with um, with NFTs? Is that possible? <laughs> um, there's certainly many ways to become millionaires with NFTs. There's also a lot of ways to lose all your money with NFTs. <laughs> How much did you earn from it? I'm not. I have to admit, I'm not really that deep in the NFT scene. Um, yeah, it's it's it started pretty recently. I know. So. That, that's right. Yeah. To be honest. I only really did this because I thought it'd be a nice, um, so when I did my project, I chose this topic, not because I was um, messing about with NFTs a lot on OpenSea, but I did it because I wanted to learn about the ERC20s and the ERC721s. So I really wanted to see how it worked a little bit better. Ah, uh, okay, I get it. Yeah. Um, hello? I, yeah, hello. Hi, uh, it, it's Tulio here, I'm, I have a question. Um, um, maybe I lost this part, but uh, I suppose that in some place the contract need to transfer 
the ownership from the original NFT owner exactly. to the to the contract. So, so I, I I miss I miss that. So this happens in the in the vault factory. So this is quite a slim contract because all the logic is elsewhere, but this creates the new vault. This creates the new contract. And then when that's happened, your token gets sent to that contract. It gets sent to the vault. So this safe transfer, it's sending it. <laughs> yeah, baby. From the sender. <laughs> Sorry for the noise. Um, can you please, can you please uh, unmute yourself when people are talking? Thanks. I'm in, I'm enjoying the good vibe. Um, so it's sending. So basically, here you're calling, um, a function from the Open Zeppelin ELC seven two one implementation, to transfer the NFT from the sender to the vault. So Great. It's, that, it's that contract with that ID. Yeah. Does yeah. that answer your question, Timo? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You answered it. It's, it's very interesting. And I, I, I did something similar at my final project mm -hmm. because I, as I was trying to do something related to, to, to land NFT, but it's become very complicated to me at in the because of time and everything in the end they just transfer ownership so it just it's almost the same thing i i did mm -hmm. but yeah 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 thank you yeah baby that's what i've been waiting for that's what it's all about so um so uh, this function you have to approve the transfer actually uh i i got a question here actually because when when we approve the token, we need to because the the contract hasn't been created before, right? So how do we approve to? Oh, we we I think we approve to the vote, right? And then the vote will transfer to the to the uh, newly created contract. Is that right? That's a very good question. So you need to approve um, a transfer to the vault. Francis. Yeah? yeah? Go for it. To the Can vault. you say PUBG Mobile? Sorry, can you repeat? PUBG Mobile. Can you say that? I don't think he, I can hear what he said. I'll write in the chat. I, I'm, I'm not sure what... If you could pronounce this. I think um, whoever this is might actually just be truly. I'm going to try to pronounce this really well. Sorry, I, I'm not, I don't know what is the topic of discussion here. Oh, it's kind of important to me. I've been wanting to ask you, ask you this like for a long time. Pointing to you? Yeah, just PUBG Mobile. <laughs> I, I think you need to ask him that personally. We are having a, this is a totally different conversation. So that's the personal thing between you and Oh, me. this wasn't about, oh, I thought it was about PUBG Mobile. No, Am no, I in the wrong meeting? Probably oh. you are. No, this is not. <laughs> oh, okay. This is about yeah, fractional NFT. Oh, this isn't about PUBG Mobile. No. Oh, oh that's that's disappointing. <laughs> I just hope this doesn't show up on TikTok or YouTube sometime because I've seen something similar to this. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, right. Um, so I guess we were back in the token vault. So um, we 
we're going to have a quick look at some of the logic. Um, certainly one thing which is um, interesting to look at, which I mentioned earlier, um, there's not much to say about it, but it is just interesting that there is a kick curator. Um, so it's possible for the owner of the settings contract, uh, this Gnosis vault, to um, specify a new curator, curator, sorry. Um, so obviously this function requires that the sender is, is the governance um, contract. And then it simply sets a new curator. So uh, presumably a curator who had bad intentions or I'm not quite sure what he's doing, but you could imagine perhaps that's necessary in, in, under certain circumstances. Um, then governance can also, um, if governance, considers a user to have specified a silly reserve price, then they can also um, remove the weight of that reserve price. So um, everyone who holds, holds the ERC20 um, can vote on the reserve price. And if someone did that, uh, I don't know, irresponsibly, <laughs> I don't know, maybe the curator set a silly price and then uh, lost his keys then you could go and ask um, Fractional to update it for, for him. Um, so that's what that's for. Um, then I'm not really sure how much it makes sense to go through all these um, functions. There's various uh, functions that in, is interest, are interesting just for the curator himself. You can change the curator, for example. Um, once an auction, presumably the auction has not started, then he can update the length of the auction. Um, then he can update the curator fee. And he can importantly uh, claim fees. And this was interesting to me because, I mean, essentially he is getting paid um, a certain amount, um, a percentage per year. And the question is a percentage of what, and basically, um, what they calculate here is um, an amount of tokens. So he actually receives a certain percentage of total supply. And then, of course, the next question is where does this supply come from? And apparently it just gets freshly minted. So here again, they are um, minting new ERC, not a new ERC20, but they're um, from the same contract, they're creating new tokens and then sending it to the curator. And the same for the governance. So if you, I just found that interesting because if you um, participated in a fractional NFT with a 10% with a curator fee, you're basically, um, your token has a 10% inflation every year. <laughs> so you have to be a bit careful um, if you want to take part in these uh, fractional NFTs. And, and, and um... And the curator can set the fee, right? Exactly. So when you, um, do we still have you on there? So when you, um, when you create the vault, when you select, when you send your NFT to the contract, then you can slide here between zero. So actually I looked at quite a few before the meeting. All the ones I found had zero curator fee, <laughs> which seems to be reasonable. Um, yeah. if you want to have good faith in your community. Um, but it's a maximum of 10%. And that's also um, hard capped by the governance settings as well. But is that true in the actual contract? Is that just the UI or is that true in the actual contract? Is that there is a hard cap of 10%? Um, so the, if we look at the settings, We need to look at the curator fee, which is called, well, that's the max curator fee. And this is specified here as 100, which corresponds to 10%. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sorry, quick one, right? So, for example, um, since um, the fractionalization only makes sense in the context of 
this particular contract, right? Um, so if, for example, the NFT is taken off this contract, that is sold out of the contract, it doesn't exist in the system anymore. Uh, does that mean what happens to the tokens? Do they burn it, or what happens after that? You you wonder what happens when the NFT has left the contract? Exactly, yes. Okay. When it's so sold out of the contract. What happens to the tokens, the ERC20 tokens that were distributed? Okay. So there's there's two ways um, which which an NFT can leave the vault, and that's either someone has the entire supply, and then they can redeem the entire supply of ERC20 and get the NFT back. Okay. So maybe you fractionalized and then you regretted it the next morning and uh, you just wanted your NFT back. So then you could send your token. Oh, um, so that means, okay, go ahead, sorry, go ahead. So that's one use case. Uh, I guess the, probably the use case that happens most often is, um, or it, it, is when um, there's an auction, and when the person win, when a person bids on the NFT and wins the auction, then they send ether to the contract and they get the NFT in return, and then the people who hold the RC twenties can send that ERC-20 to the contract and get the ether in return. And what happens when you send ERC-20 to the contract? What happens to them? Um, well, presumably, we can have a quick look. Actually, I don't remember seeing the functions for users to claim their, their share. We can have a quick look. Um, that would be a good thing to do. Um, so that would be... We'll get back to the question in just one second. I'm just going to go through the contract really quickly. So the users can update their price and without going into this function in detail. It's a bit dry. There's different cases. So maybe no one voted yet. Maybe they're the only one voting. Maybe they already voted. Then the user um, price gets updated based on these cases, based on how many of the ERC20 they hold, the balance of, of that user. And um, we'll come back to this function just to answer your question. Let's see if we can have a look. So we'll, let's, go for the, let's go for the auction functions in general, and then hopefully we'll see the function we're looking for. So um, this function is payable. It's, it's starting the auction. So um, this is when you come to your auction bidding, and apparently this is not open for bidding, maybe because it's an ERC-1155, but um, normally what you would do is you enter your, your bid amount here, and then you, you start, start the auction. And this calls this function, start. And you have to put your money where your mouth is. You have to send the contract the reserve price in, in Ether as it states in the comment. Um, so it checks that the, the auction has not started yet. It checks that um, the amount that you've sent is, is indeed greater than the reserve price. And then there's an interesting requirement, which is that enough user, or better, more precisely, enough tokens have voted on, on, a, on, a, on the price. So if not enough people participate, to specify the reserve price to buy out this NFT, um, then it, then it, you could also can't start an auction, which is maybe the what's happened here. But the reserve price is also zero, so that's a bit strange. All right. So um, bid also has to be a payable function because when you want to outbid someone. You also need to send um, the amount of ether to the contract. And let's just check. The, this function is interesting. So this is worth digging into in a second. Um, winning is the address of the, of the sender.
so um, when he gets outbid, presuming that the bid it's been successful, then he gets his um, ether or wrapped ether back. Then the auction price and the person or the account that is winning gets a place. Then um, when the time of the auction is over, an auction can't run indefinitely uh, as it's specified in the settings, it, I think it can run for two weeks. Then um, once that time has come to an end, you can call the end function. And then the winner of the auction gets the NFT. So here we're transferring the NFT out of the contract. Then, ah, here we go. This is the redeem function. So if you hold the entire supply, Yeah, I think I'm beginning to get this. Then, then you get the NFT back. Yeah. And this is interesting. So here you're burning the RC20. Yeah. That belongs to the sender. And you're burning the total supply of the token. Mm -hmm. So presumably if the sender does not, they don't check. But presumably if the sender does not own the total supply, this fails and the transaction is reversed. Make sense? I don't think it doesn't have to hold the entire supply since um, that's please me thinking out loud, right? Since he has gotten, he has gotten, um, he has gotten, he has gotten the token. That's I mean, sorry, the NFT. So I, I assume when we go to this wallet, probably uh, it just burns the entire supply. So I just, I'm just wondering what of the balances that still exist. In those people's accounts, I assume there is the balance is somewhere that is sort of like a key value, key value, addressed balance, addressed balance. That doesn't show, or maybe when it burns total supply, that disappears as well. So for me, the I think the only use case for this function is for the curator that created the vault and then wants his NFT back. So when you when you create the vault, you you get the entire supply of ERC twenty. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and then the aim, I mean, presumably you then want to share it with other people. Um, otherwise, there's no point in fractionalization. Yeah. So so maybe you create a, a Uniswap liquidity pool, for example. And you you put in part of the total supply with um, with some ETH that you have. It's quite mm -hmm. an expensive process. Um, to provide enough liquidity so then people start can, can start buying your token. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, as soon as you've done that, then you'll never get the total supply again, probably. So I think this is really only, it's like a cancel button, basically. Um, so if the person doesn't have the total supply, he can't redeem, right? I'm, I, I presume, Francis, that basically the burn function, I'm pretty sure this is from the um, Open Zeppelin ERC20 yeah. implementation. Yeah, exactly. That, and, and this function too. That um, if, you, if it can't burn, like if, if sender does not own total supply, this function fails and reverts the transaction. Can we see the function? Can we see total supply function? Um, we can try and find it. Or probably it just returns a variable. I think you should search for ERC20 uh, GitHub. One second, Francis, maybe. So they do include the, um, all the contracts here. So maybe I can. Yeah, yeah, I can say it's function. Here we go. Yeah. So this is from 
Um, I just response B. You can see this is from the open Zeppelin implementation, right? Yeah. So <laughs> it's just returning the talks as well. Uh, let's see. That's quite interesting. So I guess I guess when it mints, so let's let's go to the mint function. Maybe we can find the mint function. I thought it's the burn function. So if you look here, the the state, the total supply, gets updated every time you mint. Mm -hmm. And correspondingly, it gets updated in the other direction when you burn. Yeah. Make sense? Yeah. So I would assume that before you go for the auction, all the tokens are transferred back to the sender's address because that's the only because that's the burn function takes the the address of the that's the address from the token to be burned and then the amount of token to be burned so that means all of that must exist in that address mm -hmm. right i mean what what they could have done i'm not sure if i can answer your question sorry um but just quickly what they can do is let me see if i can find that function also, the bone, I think, is a private function. So you can actually just check that it is on this, it's implemented on this contract, not open exactly. Go ahead, please. Yeah, so, sorry, I've been all I want to say was what they could do is they could check balance off first from the account and check whether it's equal to total supply. But I guess they do that for they don't do that for gas considerations or whatever reason. Maybe it's, it's just um, people that write these contracts all the time know what this does. <laughs> can, can you check? Can you check the function bond? That's underscore bond. You can see the definition. Yep, sure. The, uh, we had it just a minute ago. I think clever to search. Here we go. So um. you burn from an account. You burn an amount from an account. Yeah. So. So what? Before token transfers. Um, so that's an interesting function that I only stumbled upon looking at these contracts. Actually, um, it's like a hook that that Open Zeppelin. I don't think it's part of the standard. I'm, I'm not sure. But it's a hook that's provided to allow you to do something before you transfer. Yeah. Just in case you want to implement something like possible. We can have a look. I think it's maybe um, look at, better to look at a concrete example in the vault. Um, there's a few threads going on at the same time. Maybe we look at the, the concrete example first. Uh, here we go. So here you see, in this case, it's um, it's overriding the the implementation, and um, this basically gets called before any transfer. So. And what's interesting is if um, this handles the use case that a user owns tokens and has voted on the reserve price. And um, if they then send the tokens away, then their, their waiting vote on the reserve price should be null. And that's what this function handles. I'm not sure if that makes sense. So it's quite a nice use of this hook. So it, I think it's just called before. Let's see if it's only exactly, it's only an implementation here, but this function actually gets called within the transfer function, I believe. Um, I'll let, let's see if we can read the documentation. A hook that is called before any transfer of tokens. This includes minting and burning. 
Um, and so here you can see, yeah, exactly. So the, the, the fractional contracts use this hook in order to make sure that the state of that of their contract gets updated according to the balances of the contract. I'm not sure if that helps <laughs> any understanding. Otherwise, feel free to ask ask your question again. I get it. I get it. Okay, cool. Um, so that's I found that quite interesting. See, I hadn't seen that before. Um, I'm swimming. This this was the other function that I wanted to the this this bunch of functions I wanted to have a quick look at, and I think that's the end of the code. Um, so bear with me. So, um, presumably, if you believe the NFT, the underlying NFT is is going to gain in popularity, and someone wants to buy it and become the exclusive owner of this NFT then you might be interested in owning the RC20, not because the RC20 uh, goes up in price, but because someone actually buys that NFT. And um, when, if that's the case, then you get paid a proportion of the proceedings to the auction, weighted by the amount of um, the RC20 tokens you hold. And <clears throat> that's exactly what's happening here. I'm not quite sure why it's called cash. Um, but it's like cash out, I guess. Um, yeah. Basically, once the auction has ended, that's required, then they check the balance of the, of the, of the caller, of the sender. Um, presumably they have greater than zero balance or there's, there's no share for them to claim. Then, um, Then a share is calculated based on their balance. And the total supply. Then their balance gets burned. And then they get sent uh, the Ethereum or the wrapped Ethereum. I'm just stumbling over the fact that we use total supply, but burn changes the total supply. Come again. Um, but I don't know if we need to look into that now. But um, it, it, for me, on first face, it on first impressions, it doesn't look correct. But I'm, I'm sure it must be correct if it's been <laughs> been audited. Um, I think I think I think you might be mistaking the total supply for total supply in circulation. So some of the supply might actually be bonds. So those ones then they are not in circulation, but they are part of the initial amount of tokens minted. You get just like Ethereum, you have the maximum total supply, and then you have the total supply in circulation. So some might be off circulation in the wallets that hasn't moved for a long time, and then some have might have been burned as well. I'm not quite sure why why it looks at the balance of this uh, contract. But um, but we're all getting a bit tired, so I think we should perhaps move on. <laughs> The only thing I would quickly mention is um, is this function. I think um, actually I had a thought there. So I think um, okay, it's a state after the auction's done, and so say like the auctions had a hundred ETH put into the contract because of it. So if you have a hundred tokens, ERC twenty tokens total, and you have say 10, uh, 10 tokens. Yeah. Then you're then you're sort of you have the right to ten percent of the auction proceedings. Absolutely. Thank you, Jeff. But then now you you pretty much you redeem you give the contract ten ERC twenty tokens, and it'll give you back uh give you back ten ETH. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking. But then it actually, but then yeah, then it mutates the total supply if it burns your 
Um, oh no, no, actually it makes sense because then yeah, so then it burns, so then it burns your tokens. It makes sense. Uh, so there's only 90 ETH left and 90 SE 90. 20 tokens. Yeah. So then if someone else comes with 10 tokens, they, they can then redeem for 10 ETH as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for clearing that up. Um, you're much more awake than I am. <laughs> that makes that makes sense. I've actually I'm actually like half asleep. <laughs> Yeah, you did it. You did. It. You explained it very well. Thank you. Yeah, that's absolutely <laughs> right. All right. Um, last function to look at. Um, so what's interesting is he tries to. Send so he calls send Ethereum or wrapped Ethereum. He tries to attempt an Ethereum transfer, which happens down here, um, which is done with a call. And if that fails for whatever reason, maybe because he sent, I think I get it now, maybe he's sending it to a contract and the contract has too much logic and there's not enough gas, so it fails then um, then this, this function will fail, in which case then he um, it's done via the wrapped Ethereum contract. So then then the, the amount of um, wrapped Ethereum is deposited to the, to the um, WETH contract and then it's transferred to him, which presumably uses a deterministic amount of um, gas because it's just a contract call on, on this contract. Does that make sense to anyone? Or does that make sense to everyone? <laughs> yeah, I think it makes sense. It makes sense. I get to the last part. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, so we've gone on, we've, we've gone on for an hour and a half. Um, I think we that wraps up the code, unless there's any questions from anyone. Um, so all I wanted to say now is um, thanks to Francis for mentioning the um, this new NFT fractionalization implementation, which has been proposed as a new um, Ethereum improvement proposal. Um, that's obviously quite interesting. Um, I'm not sure if I really see the advantage of that. Well, I mean, I see the advantage, but I think that if you have a look at the next point, this this platform that's coming, Spectra, um, <clears throat> looks to be very interesting. And the problem with fractional is that you want to ex be able to expose as many people as possible to your ERC20 token. So you, what do you do? You go and um, uh, create a liquidity pool on Uniswap, for example. Um, but obviously you need to have financial backing in order to make that possible. And Spectra tries to solve this in a different way by um, using uh, balancer liquidity bootstrapping. Um, this, this platform has not been launched yet, but they have a very nice, um, um, site and white paper, which um, is worth having a look at if you're if you're interested in this topic, and um, that's basically um, that's basically uh, material for another another uh, meetup. I think uh, not, not for today. Okay, can, can you briefly explain why is Balancer def um, better than the Uniswap? Why why is creating liquidity with Balancer if better? I, if I could have done Francis, I would have liked to. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, you can. They do justify it in the in the light paper here. Um, okay. But now I have something else on my to do list, <laughs> which is learning more about this protocol here. Yeah. So thanks. <laughs> this is where they talk about it. They talk about um, initial distribution offerings. 
So yes, that's um, at least two more topics now for the for the next for the next meetups, if anyone's keen. Um, so yeah, there's a lot happening in in this area as you as you can see, and uh, I'm interested to see how it goes. Mm -hmm. um, and at the end of your slides, um, um, I just put in some doc some some documents that I use. So fractional art actually has some quite nice documentation that I found uh, just before <laughs> the meetup. So I didn't really get to read it earlier on, but uh, they have sort of some Gravi some developer documentation to help you go through the, the functionality. Um, uh, the a link to the GitHub contracts, uh, a couple of more introductory guides. If if I if I didn't manage to explain it well enough, you can have a look at this here. And then um, what did help me prepare for this was um, was uh, this link here. So that might be worth having a look at if if you're interested and didn't understand quite what I was talking about. Then this guy explains it all again. So that's quite a nice link, and I'll I'll drop this um, I'll drop this link in the WhatsApp group. I can share it here as well. Which is like um, I meant to do that at the beginning. <laughs> PUBG Mobile. <laughs> okay. So so is your final project basically creating what fractionalized NFT is doing? Exactly. Um, it's in. My final project was um, was a fractionalizer, so it, it's kind of it's doing what fractional does, but it doesn't implement all the fancy governance. It obviously, okay. doesn't have any proxies, <laughs> um, mm. and the functionality is much smaller. So it's it's a much smaller um, set of um, set of code. But what it does do is it um, it. It, it has a one central contract which manages. Um, um, I'm looking at my assigned desk. Um, so, what it does do is it, it generates. So, when you fractionalize, um, you put your contract in here and your ID, you approve, and then you. You put in your ERC twenty parameters um, and fractionalize. Then it generates a new ERC twenty on the fly, which, which I really enjoyed doing. I thought that was really cool. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I I won't I won't dare dig into the code now. I think it, we're running um, running quite late. Yeah. Um, but it, it it basically the functions that you have are. Um, you just specify a buyout price. It's not an auction, and then you can buy it from the market. Um, and if you still own all the ERC twenties, so this is like the cancel button. So if you if you hold the entire supply, then you can approve a transfer and, and send them back to the contract, and then get your NFT back. Mm. Um, if someone else has bought the NFT. Um, then you can claim um, a payout, which is proportional to the amount that's in the contract. So it has those basic functionality that we just looked at. It doesn't have curator fees and it doesn't have auctions. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thanks so much, Dan. Yeah, um, it was a real pleasure. Thanks a lot. Excellent presentation, Dan. Thanks a lot from my end. Thank you very much. Yeah, second that. Thanks, Dan.